Good morning, everyone. Glad you guys are here. My name is Adrian. I have the honor of being the founding pastor here. I'm excited uh, to be with you today. I'm excited to preach to you today. Um, I really do believe that there is a word that the Lord has given me um, to share with us today. We are in a series called Epic Shadows where we are really reflecting and asking the question, what kind of shadow is your life producing? What kind of shadow does our church community produce? It's really important because your life will cast a shadow. Shadows can be incredibly refreshing, but shadows also at times because they bring darkness can be something that's scary. And most people never stop to ask themselves that question, what kind of shadow is my life casting? What kind of shadow is my life casting? It's because just because you have the intention that you are someone who is as honorable, someone full of faith, someone who's loving, caring, uh, does not or generous, does not mean that that's actually who you are. Because just having intentions for something doesn't make you something. It's actually direction. And so what I'm hoping we're doing in this series is to kind of compare and contrast some different things, but to kind of stop us and wake us up to actually evaluate. It's always important that we, we do this. And so with that being said, I'm going to pray for us. I'm also excited about doing Q&A at the end, um, and we're going to have a lot of fun. So, Father, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we ask you to visit us today. We say, come, Holy Spirit, reveal God the Father, reveal Jesus the Son. We love you, and we honor you. It is in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. If not, it will pop up right here on the screen. Mark 4, starting in verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. Although other boats followed, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, teacher, do you not care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Over the last year, I have begun to realize that there was something in the backdrop of my life that really dictated my life. In moments, I felt it. In moments, I was very aware of it. But most of the time, it was in the backdrop of my life, just like there's music that plays when you're just cleaning, cleaning the house and something's in the background, or a TV show that just plays in the background. It was something that I kind of knew was there, but it was not on the forefront of my life and the forefront of my mind. But what what was began to be revealed to me by God over the last year and some change is this thing really has been a pushing, motivating factor, something that has moved my life. It has impacted me as a follower of Jesus. It's impacted me as a husband. It's impacted me as a father. It's impacted me as a friend. It's impacted me as an entrepreneur. It's impacted me as a pastor and on and on. This one thing that's so incredibly subtle that it just kept pushing my life. And that one thing is fear. It's this word fear. Now, if you were to ask people, that wouldn't probably be one of the first things they would say about me, that he's a fearful person. Because the fact that I have taken some risk in my life, sometimes I'm willing, you know, I, I, I'm willing to, to take on things that would seem like a crazy idea, you know, like planting a church in the South as a black man in some of the most racially charged times in history. That was a cool idea, all right? Um, The fact of the matter of starting things in the Bible, I could go on and on. But it really has driven me. It has driven me so much my interactions with my kids, my interactions with my wife. And see, even when I mention that, I know many of us, you probably can at some level relate, or maybe this is something that's going to wake you up. 
because we are inundated in a culture of fear. Fear is the new currency. Fear sells things. That is why we have such shocking headlines. That is why when something happens, it's never going to be subtle. It's going to be the wildest statements because why? It drives fear. Leaders now, they lead by a place of fear. If I can create more fear in you of the other side, or I create more fear in you that if we don't have this, then the world's going to come to an end, it means I can have more control. Fear is where we live. And see, here's the danger. Just like I said, fear was in the backdrop of my life. It's because when you're always in the culture of it, you don't even recognize it. You just think it's normal. That it's just normal to live in a constant state of fear. Parents live in a constant state of fear. We feel like there's going to be more abductions now than there were back then. And it's not true. But we've been taught why I fear we have instant access. We get to see all the bad stuff that happens instantly. And what I've realized is that I was casting a shadow of fear. The story we read today was right after what they call the Sermon at the Sea. Jesus at the Sea of Galilee, and he had a boat, and he pushed it off the water, and he begins to now teach. And so Jesus was doing what he normally would do when he would teach. He was teaching about this new kingdom, a new way of living, a new way that those who were saying that they were going to be his followers were called to live. And this moment, he's really emphasizing this idea of faith. And so Jesus, like a great teacher, begins to break it down. He begins to talk about the heart and and how you have to be prepared to be a person of faith. And he begins to give analogies about soil types and things like that. Now, most of you know this about me. I don't like the outdoors, okay? And so when people start talking about soil types and things like that, it's like Charlie Brown, right? If you ever saw that old cartoon, it's like, wah, wah. Like, I don't hear what you're talking about because I don't know what you're talking about, right? But I just trust Jesus in this, all right? Soil type Rocky, I guess that's bad. So he talks about it, but he's really given this metaphor about how your heart should be. And then he starts to cast a vision for it like a good teacher. Not only is he saying how you have to prepare yourself, how you receive it, but also he begins to cast a vision for it of what it actually will look like when you have faith. He begins to show that, man, he says something wild in other, in other gospels where he says, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, that, man, you can ask the, a mountain and throw it into the lake. You can speak to a mountain and throw it into the lake. Now, here's the thing. This is how saved I got. I was one time early on in my faith that I was by a mountain, and I told the mountain to get in the water. Now, Jesus was giving an example. That wasn't like really what he was meaning, but what he was saying is that if you have just a little bit of faith, it can actually change and impact the world. But Jesus is not just a teacher who's going to teach to you from a cognitive standpoint. He's just not like a professor who teaches you information. A good teacher not only teaches you the information you need to know, but he also puts you in experience. So now, let's put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the disciples. You just got done hearing a sermon about faith. Your favorite communicator, a, a, a story that got you so stirred up. I mean, emotionally, you know, if you heard about it, you're like, I'm about to go, I'm about to go change the world. Yep, I came in here with no faith. I came in here worried. I came here doubt. Now I am full of faith. You're confessing stuff. I mean, you're naming stuff in scripture you never heard of before. Like you're just saying all this stuff and you have faith. And here's the thing. Now imagine how you feel, but here's what happens. Just like when we hear sermons and and I may preach and you may get really excited, but then you got to walk out of these doors. Like faith is great in here. Man, we'll sing songs, we'll get excited, y'all will amen me, that's good, whatever. But all that ceases when reality hits. When you walk outside, and where you're at mentally is still the same. Where you're at financially is still the same. Where our world at is still the same. And now you have to make a choice is that will you actually now become someone who lives by faith? We learned last series, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. What faith is, it's not the absence of there may be doubt, but you keep moving toward where you feel like you're supposed to go. Even when you can't see it. And see, the disciples now heard this sermon, 
now they are getting ready to have to live it. See, the thing in the Bible is when you would ever hear Jesus say, let's go to the other side, like the disciples never got hip to this. Because when he would say, go to the other side in the Bible, there was about to be a middle part. He would say, let's go to the other side. Now, I hope I'd have been aware enough that if I was in those times and Jesus says, go to the other side, I'd be like, hold up. We ain't got nothing to do over here. I can't do, you know, I ain't got no follow-up I can do on this side. I'll catch up with y'all boys when y'all, you know, y'all get on the other side. I'm going to go on my own. Like, you know what I'm saying? Y'all going with Jesus. Normally you go with Jesus, but something about to happen. But see, that's a lot of us in our lives. You need to understand that when God calls you to grow from one season to the next season, there is the in-between. And a lot of times that in-between is what he's trying to develop something inside of you. He's trying to call you. And some of you are in that season of your life right now where God is saying, come to the other side. Some of you may be coming to the other side is that you are starting to explore faith and coming to the other side is receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Some of you, you've been serving God for, for a while now and it's just kind of come routine and what God is wanting to do is to level up your faith because here's the thing, you will cast a shadow in your life of fear or faith, which one will it be? And see, here's what you have to understand about fear and faith. Fear and faith are developed many times in the same environment. Fear and faith are developed many times in the same environment. There are so many times where moments have happened in my life where God developed a greater sense and trust in him. And there's also moments in my life where God was trying to develop faith in me, but it produced fear in me. But it had nothing to do with God. It had to do with me. Remember this, don't ever think you go through things in life that on the other side of those things, you're better. Because I know many people who've gone through some stuff and they've made it out physically, but they're way worse off than when they started. They're bitter, they're cynical, they don't trust God anymore, and they hate the world. See, fear is, can be developed in the same atmosphere as faith. Fear can be developed in the fact of when my, my son was born and they said the umbilical cord wrapped all over his body and we got to do emergency C-section surgery. Right there, fear happened. But then I watched doctors do their work and then that same thing, faith happened. And again, when they were going back there, I was just like, God, I'm just going to trust that you're going to do what you're going to do. And in that moment, I watched God show up and God do something amazing. Here's the thing. In that moment, as God was doing that, he built a faith in me. But there's also been moments where I was believing for something and it didn't happen when I thought it should happen. So now I begin to believe fear in me. So I want to ask you, the last time you went through something, I want you to think about it. Do you have fear or do you have faith? What was produced? And here's the thing. Faith is not a one-time, having faith is not a one-time event. Having faith is a lifestyle. Being fearful is just not a one-time event but being you can end up having a lifestyle of fear like I did without even knowing. Back to the story. So the disciples now, they're in this storm. Now, let's be in the moment. Now, they're on this boat, all right? First of all, why are you in a boat, all right? And so again, like my kids want to go on a cruise this summer. I'm like, why? Can we go somewhere on land that's all you can eat? I don't care. Like, you know what I'm saying? I go anywhere, but... But they weren't like on a cruise ship either. You know what I'm saying? They're on a little raggedy wooden boat, okay? Now, they're in this boat and they're crossing over. And there would be these storms that would happen during the Sea of Galilee where wind would swoop down because the way it was placed within the mountain range and wind would come down and there would be these violent storms that would happen really quickly. And so this wasn't a normal storm because these were seasoned fishermen. So we can just assume that with them being seasoned fishermen, for them to freak out about their lives, that all of a sudden now they knew that it was something bad that was happening. And all of a sudden they began to become desperate. They began to freak out. This idea of becoming desperate for something where many times being desperate on one side of it can be you can be hopeless. On the other side of desperation, you're willing to do something that you never would do. The disciples became desperate because they thought their lives, were, their lives were in peril. They thought that they were getting ready to die. And when I read this story and I try to put myself in the story, I know this. I would have responded just like them. Because I've had moments in my life that was not about death where I questioned the goodness of God. It wasn't even about death. 
It was about something small, and I begin to question, was God actually there? But see, the thing about desperation, it leads to separation. The question is, what is it separating you from? <coughs> because healthy desperation, especially biblically, it can separate us from the created so that we can cling to the creator. When fear becomes a thing, desperation separates you from the creator to the created. I'm going to say it again. Desperation can create in you a separation to leave the created, to trust the created. And what I mean by trust the created, it is anything. I mean, it's, it's our bodies, it's us, it's our skills, our abilities. I mean, it could be money, it could be sex, it could be whatever, whatever you want it to be. That you leave the created and you're grabbing and you're trusting more in the creator than the created. If it's fear, what you will do is you will, you will cling away, you will move away from the creator and grab to the creator to help you. See, that's what I begin to realize in my life is that when I begin to grow, when I begin to move forward, there were things that God was wanting to do in my life, but I, be, but, but I started to realize how much fear I actually had of my life, fear of death that was in front of me. That I was so worried about all, I was worried about this because I was like, it was really easy to stand on stage and preach to you and say to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a whole other thing when maybe you're facing a diagnosis that could go one way or the other. It's easy to preach the Bible when the Bible doesn't have to work for you. It's easy to do it. It's a whole different thing to believe it when that's the only thing you have. When it's the only thing you have. And most of us don't put ourselves in any position where the Bible actually has to work or where God has to move. Because what we do is we put ourselves in position that we can get ourselves out of it. And what you will say is that it's just you being a good steward of your time, talent, your treasure. But what it is is that you're a coward. And that's what I began to realize about my life. That was incredibly cowardly. That things that I've done, and people would say, oh my gosh, you've done these great things. But deep inside, I've done certain things in my life that I knew that, man, that I thought with my own ability I could do. And God, I just need a little bit of your seasoning on it. That's it. Like I, don't need, like, I don't need you to cook the meal. I need a little bit of seasoning. And if you don't show up, the meal may be okay. It ain't going to kill nobody. But what God began to speak to me was saying, the shadow you're going to leave in your life for your children and for others, for, for here and for, for years, that, that I've put a long life in front of you, but the things that are actually coming your way, that they are going to have to be faith, and you're going to face a lot of things that's going to stir up in your heart of fear. And the question is going to be, what are you going to cling to? Because I'm going to put you in a situation and in situations where I have to show up. And one of the things that I was reminded during that time is how God would show up. I've got so many stories of thought times I thought God was never going to show up, and he did. But it's so easy to forget. So here's the question. Desperation leads to separation. What is it separating you from? Back to the story. The disciples now are, you know, they're panicking. And all of a sudden, they go and, and, and when we read it earlier, it said that Jesus was in a specific part of the boat. He was in the back of the boat. Knocked out. Gives me good theological reason to take naps right there. <laughs> so Jesus is in this cushion. He's sleeping. Nothing in the Bible is misplaced. Nothing in the Bible is wasted. Jesus is in the back. Now, if you know anything about a boat, which I don't know that much about a boat, but what I do know about a boat is the stern is the back of the boat that controls everything. So it's not coincidence that Jesus is in the back of the boat. But what I've also realized, too, that in the midst of storms and hardships that you go through in life, it'll feel like Jesus is asleep. Because here's what happens. You'll go through something. God will say it's time to go over here. And when he tells you it's time to go over here, and then what do we want? The entire time we're going over there, we want God to, okay, tell me what to do next. Tell me what to do next. What am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Tell me if I'm doing the right. Do I, do I look to the left or do I look, do I look to the left or look to the right, God? Uh, I don't know if I should do this or not. What if I do this and I blow the whole thing up, God? I'm going to mess it up. God, I thought you were real. Why didn't you tell me to go and you're not speaking to me? Because he already did. 
he told you to go. And when he speaks, the one that tells you to go will be the one. I said, when God initiates a mission, God's always going to provide for it. And so he begins to tell you to go and see in the midst of those things, he wants you to trust. And when you hold on to his word, is just enough. Some of you, you want all the stuff and God's going to ask you, is my word just enough? And so he's sleeping because he tells them that we're going to the other side. So he knows we're getting to the other side. And so the disciples are freaking out, and I get it, man. I would have been the same way. I mean, like, dude, I mean, like, maybe I would just, okay, like, I, I, this is over. This is it. I messed up too much, God. This, this is about to capsize. I'm about to die. <laughs> now, Jesus is in the back sleeping, and all of a sudden, they go wake him up. And Jesus is laying there, and, and as they're going to wake him up, I mean, I, he's in the back of the boat. And, and, of course, in the back of the boat, like, I don't know if he had the only covering of the boat or what, but, like, he probably felt the waves and things like that. But the waves and the things like that did not rock him. See, some of you think God can't show up in waves because you've made a God who looks like you and you know you. You've projected a God that's you. And so when storms happen, you know how much we punk out. So you think your God's going to punk out because you've made up a false one. And so now here's what happens. So you've made this false God that you've created. And you're wondering, do you not care that we're going to die? Remember, he just got done talking to him about faith. He just got done talking about if you just have a little bit of faith, it'll grow to this great tree. He just got done talking to them, and they were really hyped, and now they had to live in reality. Let me tell you this about a word from God. A word from God that he'll speak to you will always be tested. God will test that word because let me tell you this. That's why you'll hear something in church, and you know God will speak. And let me tell you this. When you're like, yeah, that's a good word, Pastor. I like that. And you write it down. Please understand this. When you write it down and God speaks it, it will be tested. And most of the time that test is like, oh. (laughs) See, the storm... See, what determines if you cast a shadow of fear or faith is really what sits on the stern of your heart. That's what determines if you're going to cast fear or faith in your life. Because that's the constant battle. The constant battle for the rest of life is this. Who will sit on the throne of your heart? That's it. That who will sit on the stern of your heart for the rest of your life? And here's the thing. Every day it's a choice. Because that's what was revealed to me is that how much I want to sit on the throne of my own heart. That I want to be in the stern of the boat controlling it. And God, like, listen, like that whole thing, that God, like I'm your co-pilot, or God, you know, he's a co No, 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 there's no such thing that God's my co-pilot. Shirts are stupid. <laughs> there's one pilot, and I'm just a passenger. And you know what happens? When the captain says, buckle your seatbelt, yes, sir. Don't get up. Yes, sir. Put the tray table up. Yeah, that's it. I listen to what is said, and then I obey. But when we live in this false dichotomy of a world to where it's like, oh, Jesus is my friend. He's my co-captain. And me and him just kind of do it together. Yes, he wanted us to do this. But here's what has to be settled. Some of you have not settled this issue. Is he Lord or is he not? He can never be your friend until you settle if he's your Lord. That, that, listen, that idea, well, Jesus said, I'm a friend of God. No, he is not your friend if he's never been your Lord. Matter of fact, the Bible tells you this. If God is not your Lord, you're an enemy to him. Yeah. And no one wants to say that today. They don't want to say that I'm an enemy of God. If you do not believe in Jesus' finished work, the Bible teaches you are an enemy of God. And people don't want to preach that to you. Why? It's because what it'll do is it'll keep places like this filled up. Why I talk this way is because I'm literally, everything in me is the broken parts of me. It's trying to run you away. (laughs) And if you stay, 
I know it's real. Like, you can't keep showing up here and then not become real. Because after a while, you're like, dog, I can't, this dude, every week I come in here, man. <laughs> every week, this brother just yelling every week. And every week, I feel, I'm not trying to make you in any way feel bad. But what I'm trying to do is to awaken your soul. To awaken your soul that Jesus is far more than just a figment and a religious figure from 2,000 years ago that gives us good advice. But actually, he's a God who resurrected from the dead, who now is the one that was called the rule and reign of our lives. And he is different than any other God or any other religion. I don't care what anybody else tells me because he's the only one that said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one finds the Father except me. Jesus was an elitist in that moment. He's saying there ain't going to be how you work. It's not going to be uh, how much money you gave. It's not going to be how much of a nice person you are. It's going to be the fact that did you know my son and what did you do with him? And he said, there's only one way and it's by my death. You can't earn your way because you're not good enough. Some of you keep trying to earn your way to God and I need you to hear this. You can't do it. It's a false, it's a fool's errand you're on. Don't know why I went there, but back to the story. Now, here's what happens. Now we're there, and so the disciples are going, and, and they're freaking out, and Jesus gets up, and he does something. He begins to, like, rebuke the winds and the waves. And, like, he, they use that word rebuke. Like, you have to know that whenever Jesus would use the word rebuke, many times he was talking to the demonic. See, why this freaked them out, too, is because in that time, the way they viewed water, it was chaotic. It was uncontrollable. And they thought it was the realm of the demonic. And so when Jesus gets up, he literally quiets it by saying he rebukes the wind and the waves. They thought that the other gods control the winds and the waves. But what Jesus was saying in the moment, there ain't nothing in this world that's outside of my power. Some of you need to hear that. That, 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 that habit that you think God can't deliver you from, there's nothing outside the realm of his power. And so... He gets up and he tells the way, shut up. I'm still trying to sleep. We got these dudes freaking out. <laughs> and then he looks at him. And like a good teacher, like this is my modern translation. My modern translation is like, yeah, that sounded good on that side, right? Now where's your faith? You had faith in church. Now where's your faith in real life? You have faith over here. Where's your faith now in your marriage? You have faith over here. Where's your faith now in your friendship? You have faith over here that I could do this, but now I'm asking you to stay here. I'm asking you to stay and not to leave, but now all of a sudden you're questioning my goodness, but you had faith over here when I was telling you what you thought you wanted to hear. Where is your faith? See, another part of that story is this. It says that there were other disciples with them, or other boats with them. Right now, in this hour that we're living in, in our country, God is looking throughout the earth for men and women of faith. And what I want to be really clear on, I'm going to explain this. We're not talking about the way that happens in your life, maybe through I mean, your way that you, you're expressive and, man, it's really charismatic, whatever. That's who you are. But that's not what we're talking about. Like, that's fine if it expresses that way. What he's looking for is people, regardless of what's happening, they're still willing to move forward to him. They're still willing to trust him. They're still willing to be about his business. He is looking throughout the earth for people who are willing to go into the world, add value in tech and, and, and politics and, and the places where nobody wants to go in the school system and we're willing to go and you're willing to go into the school system that nobody wants to go in this part of accounting but you're willing to go there because you're willing to be a bright light in there you're willing to go add value be really good and then know and tell the story he's looking for faith here's why is because the world will continue to go mad like i need you to know this there were missiles that were launched the other night from iran to israel you need to know this the world isn't going back and what's going to happen? There are going to be rumors of wars and all these things. And what happens is that the people of God have been some of the biggest propagators of fear that's out there. Because what we do is we live like the Israelites did. That give us our king. We don't want you. And God is saying in this time and this era, who will be the men and women that I can say will be a representation of me? Here's where I say all that. 
other boats were with them. In the midst of a storm, it's in the midst of a storm, and when you're going from one place to the in the shadow you cast a fear of faith, it's one of the greatest ways you can speak to the God you serve because there's other boats watching you. There's other people watching you. Why would somebody want to serve a God that you act the same way they do when you go through something? That does not mean that you're not honest. Some of you, you just lie, and people see that, and you're bad at it. Well, how you doing? I'm good, blessed, and highly favored. <laughs> how you doing? God's good. <laughs> how you feel? Full of faith. <laughs> and you just say stuff like that, like they're Harry Potter-like spells. <laughs> like you just quote them all of a sudden, and all my life's going to be magical. And what ultimately God comes down to is, no, no, no. Actually, faith is being willing to say to people, yeah, like, being a Christian does not mean that you cannot admit weakness. Literally, Paul writes, in my weakness, Christ is made strong. Some of you, you lie, and you don't admit weakness, and we don't admit weakness. Why? It's because we care how we're looking in front of people. Instead of saying, you know what? Yes, this sucks. This is awful. But here's the thing. I'm still believing God. They see your life, and they're like, yo, why are you still doing, why are you still moving forward? Man, I would have not done this. Why are you still here? Things aren't going well. Go do this. And you're saying, God told me to. See, it's in those moments where faith begins to arise and other boats begin to look at you. I mean, can you imagine if you were the other boats? Like, if I was on the other boat, I would have looked over like, y'all got Jesus in your boat. I got Daquan in my boat. Freaking like me and Quan used to do dirt together. Like I'm like, man, like I like this may be our judgment time. <laughs> y'all got Jesus, y'all ain't gonna die. Do you realize the Bible says that that you are now in Christ? So when you're in a storm, Jesus is in your boat. But most of you act like he ain't. He's in your boat. Get your hands off the wheel, let him control it. I end with a quote from a great theologian, St. Augustine. I always want to say this because I didn't know this well. The St. Augustine, for you guys who did not know, was actually African. So what does that mean? He was black, all right? So in case you didn't know what the one. <laughs> Why do I say that? Oh, you care. Are you propagating rape? No, here's the thing. Because for so long, at times, I was taught a lie that Christianity was a white man's religion. And it's a lie. Some of the greatest essence of faith that we live today were done by people who look just like me. Why does that matter? It's because if I don't read the Bible and I can't ever see myself or anyone like that or have anything, then all of a sudden, then, and especially the way it's been used and misused or whatever, it matters. It doesn't mean that someone's race is greater. What we're just trying to do is just to elevate so people can actually see this. When someone says that to me, that you're propagating a white man's religion and it's fake and you're not honoring of our people, I look right at them and I'll tell them, you are a moron. Here's why you're an idiot. Because at the end of the day, let me tell you, it's the greatest movement that's ever existed. Our people were a part of it. So matter of fact, what you're doing is you're propagating a false doctrine that's demonic. How about that? Anyway. Now, when you are insulted... The, that is the wind. When you're angry, that is the wave. So when the wind blows and the waves surge, the boat is in danger. Your heart is in jeopardy. Your heart is tossed to and fro. On being insulted, you long to retaliate. But revenge brings another kind of misfortune, a shipwreck. Why? Because Christ is asleep in you. What do I mean? I mean you have forgotten Christ. Rouse him. Then remember Christ. Let Christ awake within you. Give heed to him. Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? That is my simple prayer for you today. Let Christ awaken inside of you. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you for your love and your care. And God, there are so many different people in here that they need you to awaken. For some of you in this room, it may be the first time that you're awakened to the fact that you don't know Jesus and you want to know him. And I don't want to miss this moment, but if that's you and you're saying, listen, I, I don't know Jesus. I really don't, but I want to know him. I'm going to surrender my life. I want you to lift your hand. I'm going to pray with you today. I don't want you to miss your moment today. I'm not going to have you stand up or come up front, but if you're here today saying, that's me, I want to know him. God bless you. Is there anybody else that's saying, that's what I want? God bless you. And God bless you. For those who are responding, it's this simple. It is just simply just to tell Jesus, 
I repent to say I repent of my sin. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I give you my life. I believe you died for me. I believe you resurrected three days later. I will honor you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Father, let this worry be sealed not only in their minds, but more importantly in their hearts, God. And God, those who need faith to arise in them, let it happen. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. 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 What up? Hi. So, like Pastor Adrian said, at the beginning of service, we are actually going to do something a little bit different right now. Normally, we'd go into worship, but we're going to open it up for Q&A. We've done this. We did this, actually, for the first time in our 8.30 a.m. service, and so we decided to do it again here. Yep. And it we're only going to be fun. doing it at 8.30, so I can actually convince you to come to 8.30, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. so, a, good, yeah. a good bribing point. Um, so we will have some people walking around with microphones. Let me set some ground rules Thank because you. we're nice and full, and so we won't be able to hold the microphone for everybody to ask their question, and so if you are sitting specifically in the middle, you will be past the microphone. You have no more than 30 seconds, no more than 20 seconds to ask your question. So you will ask a direct question. You will not story tell your question. I love you so much. Um, And then you will pass the microphone back to whoever handed it to you. Yes, and you will not give your opinion. (laughs) But if you want to, then you can just go start a church and have a microphone yourself, okay? So, because people will start telling me all their theological thoughts right now. So, all right. Okay, so um, I'm going to start us off with the first question. Let's do it. So first question. You talk about this idea of going from one side to another Mm -hmm. and how that is a time for us to be prepared for what's on the other side. If you don't learn how to cast a shadow of faith while you're en route to the other side, Mm -hmm. do you stay in the middle till you learn the lesson or do you show up unprepared or what's what happens? What I notice a lot of times is that people will just go back to the other side. Mm -hmm. That they'll go back to and they'll justify why they're back in the same place and then they'll just live their life on the other side of that um and what i mean by that is that it may be a part where god's trying to get you to trust him this area financially and what you'll do is saying you know and he may say hey i want you to give this up and you may say no i'm not going to do that or you know you justify it and what you'll do is always you'll go back to the other side and you can live a life this doesn't mean you're not a follower of jesus it just means that your growth gets stunted like it's the Israelites. That's why the story of the Israelites coming into the promised land is so powerful because it's a sign of how our life is with Jesus, that you cross over there. They went through the Jordan River, sign of baptism. I mean, the Red Sea, sign of baptism, right? Your past was buried. They go through. They go to the Jordan. When they get to the Jordan River, they have to cross into the promised land. But inside the promised land, there's 31 kings that are there. When you get saved, it does not mean that you don't have other battles you have to fight. You're already saved. You already love Jesus. But you know what you can do? You you can stop after fighting the first king. And so what you can do, or you can just live on the other side of the Jordan. You're in the promised land. You just then cross over to the fullness of what God has for you. And that's why when Jesus says, I come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly, most people never find the abundant stuff because they're not willing to fight. And so you can just stay and get stuck. Sweet. That was right. The, right there, right behind you. Um, as you fight to like keep your faith in the storm, what are things that you do to remind yourself of God and Christ? It's a great question. Um, the first thing is this, that in the midst of storms, I really tell God where I'm at. I think that that's one of the biggest things where people don't really get breakthrough or really understand what's happening inside of them because they're not willing to be honest. They'll just confess scripture about faith or, you know, I didn't get a spirit of fear but a spirit of faith, sound mind, all that, and it's all good, but we never tell God what's at the basement. Because why you have to be honest, because what it does is it reveals many times what is really you're holding on to. So one of the first things I do, my prayers during those moments are very clear and they're very candid with God. Um, there's been moments where I just, yeah, I tell God, I, don't, I, I just don't think you care for me anymore. There's been moments, God, I am so fearful. There have been moments where I've been angry. And, and I think there's precedent. We see this in David's writing in Psalms. So that's the first thing I do. The next thing I do is this. I really try to write down throughout the past, through past when God's shown up in my life. And a lot of times I have it like I think I have to remind myself of that. Remind myself of the many stories of when God's shown up. Because in that moment, the storms will scream at you about how God is not, how God hasn't shown up. 
And what you have to do is it'll screen back through the storms, the evidence of how God has shown up. And I know some of you may be saying, well, I haven't had those moments. Let me tell you, if you are here in this room, that's enough of one. Mm -hmm. That God is showing up and he's keeping you alive to do stuff. So again, you be honest and you remind yourself of that. The third thing is this, you have to be in community with people. Because there are going to be moments where you're not doing well and you need friends that will pick you up. That will literally pick you up and not let you quit. That's one of the greatest gifts I can tell you that God has given me is friends who will not let me quit. When times I want to quit, they literally will get on a plane. I have friends who are here who will do it. I have friends who will get on a plane and fly here not to let me quit. Yeah. You have to have people like that because there are going to be moments where you just don't have it. And they're the ones who will help lift you in those moments. So those three things. So other questions, other thoughts? Way in the back to the left. Oh, we go here. We go here. Where, wherever you want to go. You go. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to direct you. My bad. <coughs> Uh, what advice do you have for discerning the difference between fear and concern when seeking advice and counsel from those around you? Or to put it another way, how do I make sure I'm not letting others' fear limit me when I'm considering doing something risky? It's a great question. Great question. Yeah, I think that the first thing you have to do, and that's really important because a lot of times people will project their circumstance, they'll project their story on you. What you have to realize that in those moments, you have to see, okay, first of all, did God speak? What I mean by that is this, is it something in his word? I also believe that God speaks to people. Now, like I've always said, when God, you, when you hear God's voice, not in this audible voice, but something from within, within your spirit, you always go to the word of God to make sure that whatever he speaks to you doesn't contradict that. If it does, it's not of God. But if it isn't, then that's one thing I'll say. The one thing I always tell people that I need to have a word from God. Because once I have one, that is what anchors me. Um, but if I haven't, then you know what? That's where the debate will happen. I'll talk to people through it. And I think you have to, at the end of the day, you, you take advice. I listen to a lot of people, you get advice. But there will become a point in time to where you'll have to get alone with God. And you'll have to ask God. And again, you have to know how God speaks to you. I'm, a lot of times how God speaks to me, I'm like, God, if this is it, will you just, will you show me? Will you make it, uh, make it evident that I need to do this? And a lot of times he does for me. That's how it works. For you, it may be, man, I'm going to go spend time with God. As I spend time with God, he speaks, then you go. Or it may be, no, 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 this is a real check. I've had moments where I asked God that, where I had an opportunity, and I really felt I was supposed to go somewhere. But I said this. I was like, one of the guys, a mentor in my life, I said, God, if he tells whatever he says, that's what I'm going with. Now, deep within, I knew I was supposed to stay. But everything in me, the ambition inside of me, wanted to go. And I walked in, and he's never told me no, ever. And I walked in, and I told him the scenario. Here's the opportunity. He looked directly at me. He was like, nope. And I was like, well, you know, how are you going to tell me I'm a grown man? Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but, like, but that was the answer. So I think you have to know how God speaks. So I, but I would tell you, man, you really get advice. But you got to get a word from God because the word of God anchors you in those moments. All right. I'm telling myself, right, I'd like to grow in faith. Um, I'm not necessarily trying to rush myself, but I'm saying I'd like to grow in faith. Um, is that something I'm going to do in the sense that am I testing myself or is it going to happen like naturally or like what am I supposed to do in order to see that like? To see your faith grow? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, there, here, that's a really good question. Not all, again, we talked today about like storms, moments, whatever. But actually faith is developed every day. Faith is developed that when, you know what, when you don't want to, as a, someone's married, and, and at times, man, like, you know, when there's something going on or disagreeing, whatever, like, at where, or let me say this, with my children. If I want to go and all of a sudden, like, you know, I, I'm just so frustrated, and I'm so frustrated that I just want to be so, like, just hover over them and do things like that it, because of I'm trying to control it. One of the things I have to do in those moments is have faith to say, God, I'm going to. So instead of me going and having these long conversations with them, there will be times in faith that I just stop. Instead of having a conversation, I just pray for them. Um, there's moments where, you know, in faith, where, like, man, my body desires this, but I choose your word to do this. That's faith. 
we, can, we should be developing faith every day. And the way that you develop faith is by being obedient first and foremost to God's word. And that's how it gets developed almost every day. Now, there will be circumstances and situations that get created to where faith will get, you know, it'll, get a, it'll actually escalate a lot faster. But every single day you can grow your faith by just a willful obedience to God. That's my right here. Um, when the Bible says, like, faith without works is dead, mm-hmm. does it mean, th- like, worldly works and spiritual work? Or does it just refer to, like, spiritual work? Like, for example, when it when you tell people you want to do something, and they're like, well, did you put in the work? What kind of work does it re- refer to, spiritual work or both? I think, yeah, that's a great question because I think that the way that the, you're approaching the question or the way that you see those both those worlds, I don't think that's like hear me when I say this, I don't think that's biblical thought because there's no such thing in the Old Testament and Hebrew thought of sacred secular. Mm-hmm. So what I mean by that is this when I am consulting someone who's running a high tech company that doesn't know God, doing good works in faith and and leading and helping them the way that I feel that God's called me to do that, adding value to them, that is faith. That is work. I am taking the skills that God has given me to add value to someone's life. That is work. Also, preaching the gospel to somebody. That is that is another. That's the idea of a deed or faith. I think so many times we separate it. Well, I do the church stuff. And when I do the church stuff, that's I'm doing faith work. But when I just go out here where I spend most of my life, then you know what? That's just whatever. And that's what makes our jobs or makes things we do. We don't see it as sacred at all. Mm -hmm. We don't see it as sacred. Like you need to understand the work that you do is incredibly sacred. The work that you do matters. That is a sign of faith when you're there. Sign of faith is when you're going there and you're like, man, things don't look great, but I'm still going to choose to come in here and be amazing at what I do, lift people up, do my job at the highest level I can do my job at. I'm going to be a voice of reason. I'm going to be whatever. That's how you build. So I think that's what it means. You can't say you have faith and then there's no evidence by it. I think it's all, I think it's all of it. I think it's all of it. Alan? Alan? I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, this guy. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> That's my man. What's up? Um, thank you, first, Pastor. But uh, in my own life, I would say I'm kind of in that middle part. You know, and how do I make sure that I'm not only hearing the word of God, but applying it in my own life? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question, Taylor. I think that what happens is that let's use this today. I think a lot of times we'll take notes and we'll do stuff. But when we do it, do you ever look at it and ask yourself, from what I heard today, why? When I preach to you, I hope that it sparks a bunch of stuff, Mm -hmm. that you write a bunch of stuff. But here's the most important thing you can do. Why did it spark something in you? Not the quote that I said, but why did that quote do something in you? Then, so to answer your question, Taylor, hearing a message like today, then looking at something in your life right now and say, okay, where can I, where right now in my life do I need to have faith? Where do I need to keep moving, even though it seems very dark? Even though I don't see the light at them, but I know I'm supposed to do this. And then what you do, you get up and you choose to do that, that day. And you know what, some things, you may have to do it four or five times that day. And you just keep choosing to do that. Other things, man, you begin to get around, you're, or you, you read your Bible. And here's another one, like I'll never forget reading my Bible and reading that part about turning the other cheek. Like, I, I'm a fighter by nature. And I used to read that, and I used to be like, oh, and you know, this being in a competitive basketball environment, it's like I wanted to turn up all the time. And now that I have to apply it, don't slap him. Don't <laughs> slap him. Seriously, y'all think I'm joking. Like, I was applying the word of God. Y'all think that's crazy. Well, to you, it, it wasn't for me. That was like a big step of faith, all right? Because why? Because I was choosing that even though I felt, because here's what I felt like, if I didn't defend myself, then someone's going to take advantage of me. What I was saying in faith was, no, 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 God, I'm going to not respond because I believe you defend me. Mm. That was a step of faith. So I think when you read the Bible, there's something that God may speak to you, and then just try to say what's in front of me and actively try to go apply it. Let's go right here, and then I'll get you. Go for it. Okay. um, Something that I've always kind of, battled with is the understanding of fear of God 
and just fear of itself. So can you explain the difference between the two and how that relates to faith? Fear of God, fear yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Fear of the Lord is this. Fear of the Lord, when they would write that, is reverence. It's the fact that you realize how powerful he is, who he actually is, and who you are not. It's like the best way in a very low level to see it is if you've ever been in a room with somebody maybe who you admire. The first time I met Michael Jordan, I walked in there, there was reverence. There was a fear of Michael Jordan for me, right? I'm like, dude, I had the dude's freaking posters on my wall, and he's right in front of me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I know your Gatorade song. I know all of this. This is amazing, right? And that was because it was like there was a wreck of what he did. Now, again, that's a very low level of somebody being a human, but now escalate that by a million. That's how we see God, a perfect being who, man, was willing to die for us. So there's this. And so what that should teach us, having a fear of the Lord, is the beginning of saying, man, no, I know how powerful and how great you are. And so out of my respect and my honoring you, I want to be obedient to you. Mm-hmm. That's the difference versus other type of fear. All right? Um, I got, it's basically like the same question, but it's like basically fear and faith at the same time. Mm-hmm. I sometimes think that uh, God hides up in heaven because he's scared of what he created. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's great. No, I appreciate your honesty in that. And I, and I get that because a lot of times the question underneath that is the fact of why does all this stuff happen? And if God is really active, then why is he letting this? So it seems like he's distant. The question of reframing it many times is I always tried to think about this. How much stuff actually doesn't happen that should happen? Like, I mean, y'all realize sometimes we drive on the road with cars coming, like, like six, I mean, like, with nothing in between it. And people on phones. The fact that we don't have, like, major, like, death and, like, in wrecks, like, every day, multiple ones. You've ever had a moment where you're driving and you wake up and realize, how did I get here? My point of why I say is this, God's never afraid because here's what the Bible teaches us. It's like he made the world and then he was, and this is what, this is why Christianity is different is because what it says is that there was a God who made the world and he so loved the world that he was willing to come to the world. He never hides from this creation. Matter of fact, he came to redeem his creation. And so that's the difference that he stepped down to come redeem creation. One more. We'll do in the back there and then right here. All right, you got a doc. Let's go. Uh, Pastor, what, what are some spiritual tactics or strategies you use to, to be sure that your faith is not either taken for granted or misused or, or underappreciated? Hmm. Good question. And let me make sure I'm, I'm answering. So you're saying for me, how do I make sure I like Yep. 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 Gotcha. That's a great question. It's a great question. I think because of what you're saying is that there's sometimes that codependency gets mass as faith. So where you're just codependent and you just call it service. Mm-hmm. You call it Christian servitude, but you're not. You're just broken. Um, I think that's the first thing you have to constantly evaluate what's at the basement. Why are you doing it? So one of the things I do a lot, I I have what I call five minutes of real almost every day. I really ask God, tell God where I'm at. And the next thing I do, when when I start to feel some type of way, good or bad, I ask myself why five times. Because what I'm trying to get to is when something's good, why do I feel this way? Because sometimes when something feels really good, it's great, it's awesome, at the basement of that, Man, it felt great because I got whatever. Let's say I got approval. And, man, that made me feel way greater than anything God could have said. Well, that's broken. So they have to deal with that. On the other side of it, I could, man, be angry. Well, it may not be anger that's at the basement. It could be shame that's at the basement. And then I apply the scripture to that. One of the greatest things you have to do is I think most times people do not apply scripture to the real problem issues of their life. They apply it to outside. So it's like having an infection 
and just putting bandages on the, uh, over the wound instead of actually getting to the affection. Mm -hmm. And most people don't do that work because it's really painful and it takes a lot of time. That is why when Jesus says it, it's so brilliant, when he says, when you, listen, you have to take up your cross daily. What that was was that all those things that you want to do, you have to crucify. One thing I don't want to do is to look and evaluate myself. Mm. I don't. Like, it's painful because you get to see how dark you really are. You get to see how much you, like, still lack. And so, but it's every single day trying to do that. So I would say, Doc, more than anything else is, is reading the word, but then applying it is making sure that it's not codependency. The other thing, too, is this. When you ask the question of someone not taking advantage of it, is this. If God, it's, again, it goes back to a word of God. Because I've been in environments where people were doing that, but God told me to stay. Because I'm reminded of Jesus, there's moments where people took advantage of him. They mocked him, but he stayed. So that's why I would tell you one of the most important things is there's a word from God. Because when you have a word from God, you're supposed to be there. There's something far greater than what he's actually doing. So, last one. Oh, yeah. Um, my question was, why do we hide our light, basically, like, we all have a unique skill that we could all bring to the table that doesn't have anything to do with a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. Like, just like our hair, the hair on our head mm -hmm. is numbered. Like we all have a specific skill that we could do. Why do we hide that? Um, I think people hide it because I think we live in a world that um, we all are. All right, I'm just gonna say it. We live in such a false reality right now. And the false reality we live in is everybody thinks they're so freaking unique. And they're not. <laughs> you're not, man. Like, listen, I'm going to be straight up. Like, listen, yeah, you are a unique snowflake, but you're still frozen water. Yeah. Like, we think we're unique. And so here's what we do. The reason why we don't bring our light to the forefront is because if our light ain't going to get us likes and it's not going to get us people like doing this, then we won't bring it to the forefront. We want to be liked. We want to be cared for. We want people to worship us. And if we feel like, man, if my whole thing is just I'm a, I love to serve people, but, man, that's not, I got to be more this way, we're not going to bring that. Why? Because it does not feed the self-worship within me. And that's what people don't do. They doesn't feed the self-worship. And so what if the thing you do, I need you to understand this. What if in your life, no one knows your name? Mm -hmm. Will you be okay with that? Mm -hmm. And most of us, they, we won't be. I close on that part. I'm here today because I had a mother who legitimately, like, her whole life existence was like, was for me mm -hmm. and brother. My mother like from where she prayed for me to also my mother's ability that I, like my mother always showed up. Why I believe God will show up is because I literally saw that in my mom. Through debilitating autoimmune disease, through all of it, she showed up. And here's the thing, no one really knows her name, but her life was given in service to her kids and her family and to my dad and whatever. And because of that, I run in a different way and impact a lot of people because of her faith. And so let me tell you this, somebody, listen, most of you are addicted to people knowing your name, but what if they don't? Will you still be okay with God? That's the question.